John chapter 2, we'll be looking in verses 1 through 11. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The title of today's message is A Budget Wedding. In movies, I love big reveals, right? I love it when you know, there was the, the, the movie was going this direction, you think characters are this way, and you think the, the circumstances and the stories, whether it's in movies or books, I love it when it seems like it's going this way, and then it gets turned on its head, and it goes a completely different direction, right? Probably one of the biggest ones in cinematic history is this evil black clothed guy named Darth Vader, right? And in the first movie, he is the ultimate villain. He's big, he's menacing, he's evil, uh, he's killing people, he's choking people, and uh, he's, he's, he's a bad guy. And so all the first movie, he's terrible. And most of the second movie, he's still a terrible guy. But at the very end of the second movie, what happens? He's fighting his son. He's chopped his hand off because he's not a good guy. And, uh, and, so, and so he is talking with Luke, and he is talking about his father. And Luke says, hey, man, something like this. Sorry, I'm going to paraphrase here. <laughs> and he says, he says I, you, you killed my father. And what is Darth Vader? And he says, he says, no, I am your father, right? And you're like, what? <laughs> what happened? The, the story completely shifts. He was this guy. It was pure evil, unredeemable. Then all of a sudden it's turned and it begins the process of him becoming good. Spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't watched Star Wars. I probably should have mentioned that beforehand. But let me tell you about a, big, a bigger uh, reveal. The biggest reveal in the world is the Son of God came to earth and for 30 years he refrained from using his power for 30 years he lived the life of a humble carpenter but then the beginning of his ministry would start and his first miracle would begin his public ministry and what people thought about Jesus completely turned on its head the same guy who was like wasn't this the dude that just helped build my mom's house and now there's something different about this guy it is the biggest reveal in human history so at this wedding we see Jesus first miracle but John calls it a sign and we're going to get into that more later on but a sign is a miracle with a message miracles were not just about compassion Jesus did care about people and did want to help people's needs but most importantly it was about revealing who he was and so the main point of today's message is Jesus reveals the heart of God. So let's look at our passage today, John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So his mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, the water had now become wine, and, did not, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone who serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. In verse 11, This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him and after this they went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days so let's pray 
Father, thank you for this morning. God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that God has chosen to reveal himself in the person of Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to understand who God is, what he is revealing about himself in this text. So Lord, speak to hearts. Lord, speak in ways that I cannot. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to look at our text. I want to break it down a little bit, and then we'll make some principles and some application points at the end. So in verses 1 through 3, we see Jesus is in Cana in Galilee, this kind of northern, close to northern Israel, and, and, and the mother of Jesus was there. They're at this wedding. He was invited to the wedding with his disciples, but the wine runs out. Now this is a really strange first miracle. I mean, if you were going to invent something later on about Jesus being the Son of God, I don't think I would have started here. It's one of the most low-key miracles uh, that he does. But this is not a, a story made up to impress people. This is what really happened. And so the gospel writers are telling things as they really are, real events and real history by a real person. But it is strange that Jesus' first miracle is helping a catering disaster. That's what it is. It's a budget wedding. Anybody, did anybody else have a budget wedding? <laughs> right? <laughs> I had a budget wedding. And uh, my wife, she's wearing dresses. Was it your mother's or your grandmother? I don't remember who it was. But, but I mean, at the end of the day, it was, uh, it was just, let's just get down the aisle, right? Well, these people can relate to that. They have a budget wedding and we're going to see why that's the case but they're at this wedding in cana we know that mary's invited and jesus and he has uh, approximately about five disciples at this point he's still gathering the 12 now what's different about uh, their weddings and our weddings is these weddings would last about a week so if you can imagine spending that much time with your in-laws i mean that would be great but uh, uh so they, they would they would spend uh, it'd be an entire week of celebrating and so there'd be singing and dancing and it was a lively celebration uh, it was a special occasion but we see in verse three that they have ran out of wine now for us we go you know, what's the big deal just go to costco or fries or whatever get some more bada bing bada boom the problem solved right but that's not how it worked in those days. And uh, also worth noting is this is a social disaster, that this was public humiliation in a shame-based culture. And uh, the, 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 what is it, the bride's family, that's right, so the bride's family, the groom's family would be paying for this, and the bride's family could actually take legal action against the groom's family because they hadn't fulfilled uh, their end of the bargain. So we go, yeah, what's the big deal? It would be kind of embarrassing, you know, we had some pop, a party and, and, we, and we run out of stuff. But, but that, this was a, a gigantic deal. This would be public shame for the rest of your life. So what is the big deal to them? And so Mary is potentially related because she knows about this problem. She's helping, and people who are family uh, would have been working to help this situation along. So it's possible these were uh, Mary's family members. And it's also worth noting that uh, in the ancient times, there was, uh, they didn't have plentiful clean water. They still didn't understand germs the way that we do, and they didn't have refrigeration. And so, uh, so grape juice would quickly turn to uh, wine because of fermentation. But it's also worth noting here that many times what they would drink would be one part wine to three parts water, sometimes at minimum. So we think, you know, hey, this, this, is, not, uh, this is not some kind of uh, hard liquor that they're drinking much of the time. Uh, they are drinking stuff that's just a step above water many times, but not always. But Jesus does something very low key here. Jesus is meeting an, a legitimate need. O almost all of Jesus' miracles are meeting people's actual need, whether it's blindness or the need. healing. Uh, this is a, a, a social problem that's gonna be a real problem for these people, and he meets this need. Jesus refuses to dazzle people. He refuses to be a dancing bear. Every time a people with unbelief in their hearts say, hey, do something fancy, Jesus, he refuses to do it. Now, if you and I were Jesus, I guarantee you I wouldn't have waited 30 years to be doing cool stuff. And I guarantee you if I could walk on water, I would only walk on water, right? 
If I could make food whenever I wanted to, I would never bring a side. I would just go to a friend's house and be like, bam, garlic bread, right? Gar- uh, pasta salad, poof. I would impress people all the time. But Jesus, low key, he says, I'm going to meet this need, and he does it in the most humble and gracious way. So Mary reports the problem to Jesus. Now it's likely that Mary is a widow at this point in time and Joseph has uh, already died. Otherwise she might be going to Joseph, but she goes to Jesus. And there are some things that I want to make sure we're clear about speculation because uh, I, I think we have to delve deep in the text to really kind of grasp the, under, the meaning of this. But at least some of these things are at least possible, I think, what Mary is working through. So John the Baptist has already proclaimed Jesus as the Lamb of God. And so maybe she's like, hey, now it's time. I know that Jesus is miraculous, even if nobody else does. And maybe this is the time that Jesus is going to reveal himself. She's lived with the stigma of Jesus' birth all his life. You know, people said, yeah, yeah, he's miraculous. And people said, I I don't know if that's miraculous or immoral, right? And so you know that she has dealt with that her whole life. And so maybe she is nudging Jesus. Why don't you reveal who you really are? That's at least possible. I'm not saying that's definitely what's happening, but look at Jesus' response. She says, well, she says, we're out of wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. So Jesus responds with woman. Now this is interesting. Now in our culture, if I said woman, that's a short, that's a, that's a short trip to the couch for the night, right? <laughs> But Jesus is not being disrespectful. Jesus is not sinful. And so when Jesus is talking to other women throughout Scripture, he called, refers to them as a woman. This is kind of, it's, it's akin to saying ma'am to somebody. Jesus says that the woman at the well, he called her woman, when uh, there is, uh, Jesus is being crucified and he's telling John to take care of his mother. He says, take care of this woman. So it's not Jesus is being disrespectful. He's not frustrated with her as we can be. He says, woman, ma'am, and then he says, what does this have to do with me? Which is an idiomatic expression. You see this in the Old Testament. It, it's, a, it, it's a saying people say when they're kind of saying, I'm not really sure what you want me to do about this. And they're, generally speaking, they're distancing themselves from the problem or the people when they're saying that. You see it in the Old Testament in several places and maybe in the New Testament. Now, some commentators see a potentially a mild rebuke of Mary here as was kind of when Jesus was a child and he said, this, I, I'm supposed to be uh, in my father's house. And so he's saying, this is not the time uh, that you think is going to happen. Uh, and so it is potentially sort of a mild rebuke to Mary. I think it's at least possible it is a new relationship. He said, Mary, woman, for 30 years we have related as father, or sorry, as, as mother and son. But now things are changing, and I am revealing myself for who I am. And so you will relate to me as all people relate. Mary didn't get special permission. Jesus' brothers didn't get special permission. The sister didn't get special privilege. All people come to Jesus the same way. This is the beginning of his public ministry. Now, this is, now this, this is so interesting. So just look, at this, look at this text. So she says, we're out of wine. And then he says to her, woman, what does that have to do with me? And then he says, my hour has not yet come. Throughout the Gospel of John, every time the Bible's talking about an hour, it's talking about Jesus' death. So Jesus is about to be attacked by somebody or praised by somebody, and he says, stop, don't do that yet. My hour has not come yet. And then when time comes for the top of his crucifixion and his death, he says, my time has come, that I have come for the redemption of humanity. And so he's at this wedding, and he's thinking about his death. His mom doesn't say anything about his death. She said, we need more wine. And Jesus said, it's not my time to die yet. And so it's strange, but it's worth delving into here a little bit. And so uh, uh, Mary has a different timetable, and it's at least possible, I think, is a, a fair interpretation. This is not the time of his vindication. That will happen at his death, burial, and resurrection. He is going to reveal himself, but maybe not the way that Mary wants him to at this point. 
It's the beginning of his earthly ministry was preparing for the end. So in this joyous celebration, Jesus has not forgotten what he came here to do. And so Mary tells the servants to obey Jesus. We could just end the sermon there. That's a great principle, right? Do whatever he tells you to do. That's a great thing for us Christians. Look at verses 6 through 10. Now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and the master of the feast tasted the water, now became wine, and it did not know where it came from. So the servants did. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to them, everyone serves the good wine first, and people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And so these, these jars, and we'll talk about this more in a second, were for ritual cleansing. And so they would have had a bunch of water in these homes. And so at the bare minimum, this would have been 120 gallons. And so Jesus says, fill it to the brim. I think it's worth noting it's filled to the brim because Jesus didn't say, fill it about halfway and I'll kind of dump some stuff in when you're not looking and then I'll say it's a miracle. But they fill it completely up with water and somewhere along the way, it turns to wine. What a humble way to begin your first miracle. He didn't say, alakazam, poof. And it's wine. Right? I mean, it's so subtle that half the people at the party don't even know what happened. And the only people that come back with him are his disciples and his family. I mean, what a low-key miracle. But Jesus has the servants fill it up. He takes it to the master of the feast becomes wine, shows in no subtle way that he has power over creation itself, over matter itself. The master of the feast tries the wine, unaware of the, unaware of the miracle. He praises the bridegroom. Now, I think this is worth pointing out because I've heard critics say this, is that you know, Jesus is helping people get sloshed here. And they're having a, and, and, uh, but that's not what, listen, look, look at the text. Look what he's saying. He said, everyone serves the good wine first when people have drunk freely and the poor wine. But you have brought the good wine till now. So this is a pretty common practice. He said people will serve the good wine first and then when people are drunk and can't pay attention anymore, he said they, and then we'll serve the bad wine when they really can't care. And that is a common practice. But he's not saying that is happening here. He's saying, I've been to a lot of these parties, and this is the way it goes down. But obviously, Jesus, where the Bible condemns drunkenness repeatedly in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's always wrong. So Jesus is obviously not helping people do something wrong. That's a little side note right there. That's for free, okay? Look at verse 11. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Canaan of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This was his first sign. So there's a bunch of extra biblical literature that talks about Jesus uh, doing miracles when he was a child, and, and, and they're really weird. They portray Jesus in a really strange light, but we know that those are untrue because the Bible says his first miracle happened right here, not when he was a child. And it says, and this is, what, this is what John says repeatedly in his gospel, by the way. He says, this is the first of his signs. See, a sign is uh, somewhat different than a miracle. A sign points to something greater, a deeper reality than fixing whatever the problem was. And, and make no mistake, it is a big deal when you're a blind beggar, when you have crippled body parts in the ancient time. That was no small thing to fix those problems. But Jesus always said, your greatest problem is not your physical ailment. So what you need to be is your sins need to be forgiven. You need to be right with God. And so he's saying all these miracles, they're not just to meet a need. They are to point people to who this God is. And when you understand who he is, then you can be made right with God. And it says, and he manifested his glory. That reminds us of verse 14 of chapter 1. It says, and the word became flesh, and he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father. And so Jesus is giving just a taste of his power and his glory. And it says, the disciples Believe. Now, this is important. When John's talking about belief, many times it's talking about a process. Matter of fact, there's many times in the scripture when it says the people believed no more. 
So people had levels of belief, you could say. They had some kind of interest in Jesus' power or his uh, persona. They, they, they liked those things, but they weren't followers of Christ. And so don't think the disciples were just all in at this point, because I really don't think that they are when you see the rest of their, uh, their times in the gospel and their actions and their behavior. But they are beginning to believe that he is who he says that he is. So they traveled, they leave the wedding, they travel to Capernaum. That's the story. But let's look at um, some truth for us, uh, some principles and some application points. You okay with that? Everybody awake? Okay, everybody all right. Point number one. What does this reveal about God? Well, first of all, it reveals God's concern for everyday matters. Now, I don't think this is the main point, but I do think it is a point, and it's worth mentioning. So Jesus' first miracle, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to make, uh, help us understand this. For his first miracle, he didn't heal anybody. He didn't cast out demons. He didn't raise somebody from the dead. And we know that he can do all of those things. And so for his first miracle, he says, I want to do something that is non-essential. And he chose to do that. This wasn't a happenstance. For creation existed, God knew exactly what he was going to do at that time. And this non people weren't going to die, they didn't have wine. He said, I'm going, this is my, my first miracle, the way I introduce myself. You know, we want to make good first impressions, right? When you are filling out a resume, you're probably not going to say that you're perpetually late to work, right? You're lazy. You're not going to mention those things, right? They'll figure it out sooner or later. When you're going on a date for the first time, you're going to wear deodorant. Maybe you don't normally do that, right? <laughs> you're, 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 going to make, you're going to put your best foot forward. Do you think maybe Jesus would take his, his best, his, 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 the most powerful thing he can do so people kind of get an idea of how awesome he is? He said, I'm going to do something sort of non-essential. But I, I think it shows us something. Now, in your, on your phone, you may have something kind of like this when you swipe it. It has emergency call button right there. So I can push that button even if I don't, you don't know my password and you don't, and you won't. And you can push it there just in case things get really bad and you can call whoever you need to. And I think in a very real sense, Jesus is saying, I'm more than an emergency call button. That you can talk to me anytime about anything. It's not just a small thing that you have, the, the, the big things in life, the small things God cares about, not just the emergency. God is not overtaxed and too busy like we can be sometimes. He is a compassionate father. This is a non-essential miracle. It matters to God. You know, my kids have all sorts of interests that in my own time frame, my own interests, I don't particularly care about, at least not anymore. My kids like lizards and birds and Legos, they draw a bunch of stuff that doesn't look like the things that they say it is. They care about earrings, and they love trucks. They love garbage trucks and fire trucks. Generally speaking, when I'm driving down the road, I don't go, oh, oh, man, look at that garbage truck. At least you check it out. But it happens every single time when you got three little boys in the car, Right? Dad, Dad, it's a garbage truck. When the garbage man, when the garbage man comes to our house, they go outside and they wave at the garbage man. Do you do that? Carlos, do you do that? That'd be weird, man. That'd be weird. And so generally speaking, I don't care about those things. But you know why I care about those things? Because they care about those things. And I am an imperfect earthly father can you imagine what our perfect heavenly father is like and his love for his children so go to him with the everyday concerns of your life when you're stuck in traffic when you're having trouble in your marriage and you're having great joys and you got a, a raise at your job when you have health concerns when you're wondering if you should date a person you can take all of those things to a God who cares about you. He's not just an emergency hotline. He's a father who cares for you. Point number two. 
reveals God's desire for relationship over ritual. So cleansing was required by the law. There were certain requirements where the Jews had to do this in certain places. Uh, the priests definitely had to do a, a, a lot of, of cleansing with, with water. And it was all ceremony. It didn't actually wash away their sins. But it was showing them the need uh, to go into, before a holy God. They must be spiritually cleansed. But, there was, but the Pharisees were always building up traditions around laws, right? And so the Pharisees would make people do uh, the, the ritual or the, what, was, what was required for the priests. He was saying all people should do those things. And so these, law, these, these rituals became burdensome to people. And so they were always washing in, uh, themselves in their dishes. They were always doing these things. And it led to spiritual apathy. You had people who didn't care about God. They were just doing religious activity, rituals, far with, the, with their heart far from it. So it became burdensome and a constant reminder of uncleanliness. Remember, you had to remind yourself every time I I have to rinse myself, I have to ceremonially cleanse myself, is that I am not holy before a holy God. But Jesus' life would be the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. That Jesus would come and and we we are not under the law anymore. He met the requirements of the law. And so we are not under the ceremonial law anymore because Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. And so, by the way, this is a, a side note here. When, when people who don't believe the Bible, skeptics, say things like, hey, you know, I, I don't see you doing these things. I don't see you washing your hands and, and ceremonially. You're not, you're not baptizing yourself the way they did in the Old Testament. You, you, know, you, you're, you Christians, you're, you're so inconsistent. Gotcha. Chess, check, check me. You're, you're, it's all done, right? You're, you're, just, you're not you're only believing what the Bible says. But no, Christians have always said that Jesus fulfilled the law. And so we are not under the ceremonial law of Moses anymore. That was for the Jews. We are not Jewish. Most of us aren't. But Jesus would offer his cleansing blood for our sin. He would die in our place. He would cleanse us from all unrighteousness because of what he did, not because what we've done. You guys remember the old hymn? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Remember the song? Y'all heard the song? Look at me like I'm crazy. Sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. That's good news. And so you and I can come before a holy God, not because we are perfect, but because we are cleansed in the blood of Jesus. We are covered with his perfect righteousness. But we're not careful. We can be guilty of placing rituals over relationship. You see, ritual without relationship leads to spiritual rigor mortis. Ever seen possums on the side of the road? You know, they're all stuck and bloated. And the Bible says that you have rituals, but you don't really know God. You don't have a relationship that leads to spiritual death. And you had a country at this time where many of the people's hearts were far from God. They did religious activity because they knew that's what they were supposed to do, but their hearts were far from God. And God says that you can come to a place like this, we can say, that's other religions. No, it can happen in this church, in this building, when you come and you sing songs, but your hearts don't mean it. You give money and you don't care about it. You serve somewhere and and your hearts are far from God. Then God says, be careful, because you have ritual without relationship leads to spiritual rigor mortis, leads to spiritual death. Don't just go through religious activity. You must know and care about God. Our hearts must love God. Recently, I was in Israel, and I'll be able to do a report about that in a couple of weeks. We just had something every week at the end of the service, and so I can't do it. Uh, but I will be doing it in a couple of weeks, and I'll tell you when. But if we're not careful... You can go there, and, 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 and I, was, I was moved by it. It was a powerful experience. I can't wait to share that with you. But the only reason the empty tomb means anything is because the corpse that was in there got up and walked out of there, right? He's not there anymore. The only reason it matters is because somebody defied death. 
And so Christians don't have holy sites. We have holy people. God says, I live and indwell in you. You are the temple of the holy God now. So we don't venerate people. We don't venerate saints. We worship our Savior. So friends, don't substitute religious activity for knowing the Savior. Do not do it. Do not teach a Sunday school. Do not give, give money. Uh, do not sing in a worship service. Do not think you can do those things, and it matters to God if your heart is far from them. If anything, it brings spiritual death in your life. Finally, in point number three, is it reveals the true source of joy. There was a rabbinical saying I said, where there is no wine, there is no joy. And so for the first miracle, Jesus said, this is something I'm going to do that's essential. It's not incidental. I want to show them who I am. I want to reveal who I am. And he's saying, I am the Lord of the feast. I am the master of the feast. Uh, the guy sipping the wine and praising people, that's not the real master. He said, I am the master of the feast. And God, for his first miracle, decided, I'm going to make over 100 gallons of of unusually good wine. That's what he said. That's what he wanted to do. So he wanted to reveal his heart. So I think Jesus is essentially saying there is a joy shortage and I'm the solution for it. I am the Lord of the feast. Many times people see Christianity as anti-joy, right? Anti-fun. For several years I served in juvenile prisons and taught Bible to these guys. And I can, if, I, if I heard this a million times, this is what they said. Hey, yeah, that sounds all fine and good, preacher. But I want to have a little fun first. Yeah, I, I like Jesus and, and salvation and not going to hell. That sounds great. But I want to have some fun first. But there was a huge misconception. Number one, they are misunderstanding what will ultimately bring joy. They'll find uh, sex outside of God's word and drugs uh, that, 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 that actually uh, seems good but actually turns bad in the end. And this Christianity that they're saying has no joy is actually the source of all joy and goodness. See, Christianity, for some people, is, just a, is a bargain for joy. They'll say, hey, we'll have uh, uh, no, no fun now, uh, and so uh, we won't you know, go to hell forever. So I, I'll do it. I, I really want to do all the things my friends are doing, but I won't because you know, I, I, I don't want to be condemned. And that's what some people's view of Christianity is. But Jesus is here at this wedding thinking about his death, thinking about what would ultimately save sinners He's saying this is what, 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 will, what will bring ultimate joy to humanity is being in a right relationship with God. So we sip the joy of wine by drinking death. Jesus said, I, I, we, we, are, we are enjoying the goodness and the joy. He said, I will drink death for you and you will be made right with God. I will take the cup of God's wrath upon myself, and you can have the joy of God's blessings. You see, Scripture speaks often about the wedding feast of the Lamb. Oh, let me read this, and we're getting to the end. Listen to Isaiah 25, verses 6 to 8. You've heard uh, paraphrase or kind of requoting this in the New Testament, but this is where it comes from initially in the Old Testament. 25, verses 6 to 8. It says, on this mountain of the Lord, the host of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. So the Bible talks about when the Messiah comes, all sorts of prophet, prophecies that's going to be full of wine. It was a sign of, of joy and of substance. Verse 7 says, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the re reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Tim Keller, a pastor that's recently passed, passed away, says this regarding the wedding feast of the Lamb. 
says, when we talk about sort of modern day weddings, this is what is happening in, in a woman's heart who's marrying a godly man. It says, the woman is saying, I am understood, I am loved, I am accepted by the one person in the entire world who I admire, respect, and love the most. And today, that person incredibly is binding himself to me, so everything he has and everything he is becomes mine and comes into me. On top of that, all of my best friends and all the people I love the most are coming here and watching this happen, and their cup is being filled up by blessedness. What a day. And so much more, the Bible says, the wedding feast of the Lamb will be a God who knows you, who loves you, who accepts you, by the greatest person in all of human history binds himself to you for all eternity. That process has begun now. It will be completed for all eternity. He says, what a joy it is to experience all those things with people that we love and we, we care about it in, in a wedding. And he says, we get to do that for all eternity. Not just with the God that we love and worship, but with the people who have loved and worshiped him. So friends, be careful. Don't let this world steal your joy. As a Christ follower, you don't need substances, a perfect career, health, or family to have joy in your life. You have the true source of joy in the person of Christ Jesus. So drink deeply from that well. So in closing, a sign is a miracle with a message. And God said, I have something I want to reveal to you about my son. And we are beginning to see that in the Gospel of John. And we're going to see much more of it later on. But Jesus reveals the heart of God in a way that no one else could.